Hello and welcome to week three of our Bible study looking at the life of Elisha. Our story today comes from 2 Kings chapter 4 and I'm going to read verses 1 to 7 for you now. The wife of a man from the company of prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, Go round and ask your neighbours for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each one is filled, put it to the side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There's not a jar left. That's when the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Amen. Thanks to God for the word in Scripture. So, Elisha's leftovers turn out to be the bottle of oil that is used as the object round which a miracle happens. And whether the miracle is the the non-stop oil, or is the relief of the widow's debts and her freedom uh, of her sons? Well, I'll leave that for you to guess. But let's go to the questions. What is the widow's prayer? Well, that's a trick question already, because if you look carefully at the start of the story, we don't know if the widow is praying. We know that she's talking to Elisha. And she seems to expect Elisha to do something for her. She wants help with her husband's debts. Whether they're her debts or not, I can't answer that question either. She certainly is of the opinion that they are her husband's and nothing to do with her. That's a real issue in many households where uh, lives have become separate and debts are racked up that both end up responsible for. But let's not run this poor fellow into the ground any more than his death has done. His widow has a real problem. The creditor is coming to take the boys into slavery. Does Elisha owe the, the widow anything? Last week we talked about how Elijah and Elisha stood outside of the national prophets, the prophets who belonged to the national shrines dotted about the country. They stood outside of any kind of official recognition. So maybe the obligation is very much in the widow's mind, more than it would be in Elisha's. However, God is ready to act, and the Elisha must feel the spirit guiding and directing him so that he can say to her, what have you got in the house? Now remember, the Lord knows, but sometimes the stories in the Bible require the person needing help to state what it is they need as a means and way of them admitting that they need help. A small jar of oil, that's all that they have that's worth anything. And that can't be a huge amount. So that will have to do. Generosity, God's generosity is demonstrated here. Don't just fill up the jars and jugs in your own house. Go and get all your neighbours as well. Can you imagine? If the widow has any imagination, she has got every trough, jar, jug, bottle, amphora and bath sitting out on the floor at home, pouring out 
oil unbelievably refilling, the jar never going empty, the small jar never going empty. To whom does this miracle witness? Who does it matter to? Who notices it? Well, let's count. There is the widow, first of all, her two sons. Well, Elisha sees it, but perhaps he already is more than convinced. And then there is, in addition, all the neighbours who have given their jars and can't get them back until the widow sells the oil inside them. And this miracle, what does it say? It says that God gives generously. It says that he gives when even there's only a little, a little faith or a little that's available, it can do great things. It's a good story. It's a great story. It's a reminder that the widow did nothing. Eli Elisha did nothing. It was God who did it all. And he did it from a tiny jarful of oil. Like, well... Let's get to like now. What story might be the parallel in the New Testament? What story is there of Jesus and a crowd and a very little available to Jesus, which turns out to be more than enough for everyone? Well, I hope with the picture uh, on the screen and the description I've given you just now, you can get yourself to the story either of the miracle of the 5,000 or the miracle of the 4,000. Now, I'm going to trust you to look up the story from Matthew 15, verse 29 to 39, and read the story for yourself in due course. But to keep the presentation short, I'm going to skip the reading of it, because we've already read from Second Kings. Last week, somebody spotted a very fine comparison with the book of Ruth, and so I thought I would bring it up first at the Bible study. In Ruth chapter 2, in those verses 14, 15, 16, Boaz has already seen Ruth, and it gladdens his eye, and he tells Ruth to come to his fields. She'll be allowed in his fields, kept safe in his field, and then he tells the workers harvesting to drop some, don't worry about it. Don't just worry about leaving her the leftovers. Drop some deliberately for her. Now that's more than she could possibly feel obliged to get. And that generosity is a sign of what's to come in that story. But that's not the story I was thinking of. It's New Testament. What about the, the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000? And who does this story touch? Well, seven loaves are brought to Jesus as 4,000 men and more women and children are sat down. They've been with Jesus, not for a few hours, but some of them for days. And Jesus wants them fed before they faint. With just seven loaves, he breaks and passes and feeds till all are fed. How many are touched in this story? The disciples must be as they remember this story. And everyone who ate, the thousands and thousands who ate their fill, and there was still more bread left over, they too must have been touched. Each of them wishing they had taken their fill and then filled their pockets. To see them home. God wants to bless and he blesses lives in the ordinary things of care and love and patience and guidance and sometimes he uses that which we have little of, little courage, little patience and he uses that to show how God's people can be changed and sometimes positively, because it only takes a little courage to say, I'll pray for you. I'll be there for you. 
If you need some help, give me a ring. And then, whose life do such blessings touch? They touch your life, somebody else's life, and whomever they tell that God's people and God's person was there for them in that moment. Is the woman's call to Elisha answered, or does God use her prayer to witness to a whole community? Is God interested in the relief of her husband's debts? I want to think so. But is God's real plan to show the whole village that God is there and blesses them through not great grand gestures, but the tiny ordinary things? Go and be such a blessing. And thank you for paying attention to week three in the life of Elisha.